Report the value, this school says. And reasons behind laws. All that I've just said. Uh, that they govern and protect us. They govern. They govern and protect us. In other words, they dictate to us and claim to protect us, most of them. The responsibilities that this involves and the consequences when laws are broken are also explained. You mustn't break laws, you mustn't break rules. The teacher never does. Again, be out of a job. Our school's rules um, rewards and sanctions which are displayed in all classrooms uh, referred to regularly and consistently uh, uphold um, a practical example of this visits from authorities such as the police help to reinforce the message I bet they do um, our school rules rewards and sanctions follow the rules you'll be fine you may even get a bit of benefit Challenge the rules because you don't agree with them. Bad move. And that is the message from the earliest age that the system wants uh, kids to take through the rest of their lives. Now, individual liberty. Would it be nice if we had some? That'd be lovely. Within school, children are actively encouraged to make decisions and choices. Now, here we go. Uh, decisions and choices choices now this is the this is one of the great scams freedom of choice now if I if I um, put a cake on the table and an apple on the table and I say you've got a free choice people might think well yeah I've got freedom I can have the apple or I can have the cake the point is the apple or the cake are not the only choices possible. And what the state calls choice is the choices, all of which suit the state, which you're then given the choice to choose between. So, encouraging choice. But that's saying if people make other choices, then they could be dangerous and going through radicalisation. I know there'll be people looking at this and saying, yeah, you've got to stop ISIS. This is not about that. This is not about that. It's about freedom as a whole and had, having different views and the right to have them as a whole. Children are encouraged to know, understand and exercise their rights and personal freedoms. Well, clearly they're not because there's rules galore. And you can't have an opinion outside the norm or you're being radicalised. Children are given the freedom to make choices and make decisions so long as they suit the school and so long as they suit the state. Our school um, says... We are actively uh, challenging uh, children, staff or parents expressing opinions contrary to fundamental British values, including those expressing extremist laws or extremist views. Um, so, hold on. Um, they uh, at this school are actively challenging children, staff or parents who express opinions contrary to fundamental British values, um, which the state has decided what British values is and doesn't follow any of them when it's um, uh, voting for war, voting to, um, to change um, policy that create massive austerity and suffering among people in uh, their own country that sell arms to Saudi Arabia by the billion, uh, uh, billions of pounds at a time to um, suppress uh, people in Saudi Arabia and to drop them on places like Yemen. These are British values. It's such bullshit. It's such hypocrisy. And, and in terms of the schools who are teaching our children, it's such naivety ignorance and acquiescence to the state. Um, I wrote a book in 2003 
um, called Tales from the Time Loop, which set out the scam, the manipulation and the sequence that led to the lie and lies that produced the manufactured excuse to invade Iraq. And what's coming to light bit by bit is confirming that sequence. First of all, we've had a memo come into the public arena, written by Colon Powell, who was Secretary of State in the US in the run-up and during the invasion of Iraq. And um, they call him Colon, but his name is spelled Colin. I can only surmise that they call him Colon because he's full of shit, because that is what came to be obvious when he was um, doing a presentation to the United Nations in the run-up to the Iraq invasion, selling the blatant lie that um, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which he was going to unleash on the world. And this memo confirmed, and it was written in late March 2002, it confirmed that Tony Blair, British Prime Minister, was on board and supporting the American plans for the invasion of Iraq. That is late March 2002. And right up to the invasion, in the spring of 2003, Tony Blair was still lying through his bloody teeth to the British Parliament and the British people saying that even at this late stage in the run up to the invasion, um, it could still be avoided if Saddam gave up his weapons of mass destruction, which uh, didn't exist. So we'll look at what he said, um, Mr. Mr. Liar. Um, and genetically so. Um, this is um, a speech or a statement to the House of Commons on February the 25th, 2003, very close to the invasion. And he said, I detest his, Saddam's, regime. But even now, he, Saddam, can save it by complying with the UN's demand. Even now, we are prepared to go the extra step to achieve disarmament peacefully. I do not want war. Breathe, they breathe. But disarmament peacefully can only happen with Saddam's active cooperation. The truth, they knew those weapons of mass destruction didn't exist, but they needed an excuse to go to war as part of picking off regime after regime and country after country in the Middle East, which has gone on ever since. Something else that we uh, now know is um, covered in this story, burn it, destroy it. And this is the fact that in the, the run-up to the Iraq invasion, Tony Blair's Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith, said that the invasion was likely to be challenged under international law as illegal, which would make the people taking part war criminals. And when that um, advice was presented, Someone in the Blair government circle, according to this story, ordered that that advice be burned and destroyed so no one saw it. And what then happened is that the pressure was applied mercilessly, probably, upon this Lord Goldsmith bloke to change his advice. And he did and actually gave the advice that the invasion was actually legal. And all this manipulation is going on, for reasons I'll come to in a second, because Iraq was simply 
one country in a list of countries being targeted for regime change by this global cabal that I've been exposing for a quarter of a century. And they needed excuses to do it. So weapons of mass destruction, even though it was a lie, was the excuse they chose. So this burn it story, this is, this is what the story says. The burning row relates to the 13-page legal opinion presented by Lord Goldsmith to Blair on March the 7th, 2003, less than three weeks before the outbreak of war. The opinion, details of which were exclusively revealed by the uh, Mail on Sunday in 2005, um, stated that the war was likely to be challenged under international law because of the lack of backing from the United Nations. The advice was never released and was kept secret from most of the cabinet because, you know, governments are completely compartmentalised. Most of the people in the cabinet of a government don't have a clue what's bloody going on. Um, only a few powerful aides of Blair, um, such as Number 10 Director of Communications Alastair Campbell, were allowed to see it. A senior Number 10 figure at the time told the Mail on Sunday last night, there was pandemonium. The date when war was expected to start was already in the diary. Well, it had been for bloody years, um, if not to the day. And here was Goldsmith saying it could be challenged under international law. They said, burn it, destroy it, and got to work on the Attorney General. Yes, yeah, change his bloody mind and give him the advice they wanted. Lord Goldsmith's one-page legal opinion produced ten days later, um, and three days before war broke out, stripped out all his previous reservations and declared the war to be legal. This version was discussed in Cabinet and cited in Parliament to justify military invasion. So, how do the pieces fit? Well, a series of countries that this global cabal working through Britain and the United States, that they wanted to overthrow and regime change and take over, goes back years. And Iraq was just one of them. And the first public site of this list came in September 2000 when a organization called the Project for the New American Century, neoconservatives or neocons as they um, were called, um, produced this document listing a series of countries for regime change um, and regime change as a result of what they called multiple theater wars fought by the United States, either covertly or overtly through the Arab Spring. And these countries included Iraq, Libya, Syria, Iran, and they needed excuses to invade them, to regime change them. The people involved with the project for the New American Century included Donald Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz, who then became um, Defence Secretary and Deputy Defence Secretary running the Pentagon a few months later when the Bush administration came to light. Another person involved with the project for the New American Century was Dick Cheney, who a few months later became uh, Vice President of the United States and in truth President in fact, um, while boy George Bush was reading his bloody comics or something. The document also said that this process of transformation that he called it, this series of country takeovers, would be necessarily slow, absent some catalyzing and catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. These characters came to power in the Bush administration a few months later and soon after that, in the same year, 
in fact, one year to the same month that this document was published, the United States had 9-11. And Bush called it our Pearl Harbor. As a result of that um, terrorist attack, which was an inside job, that's why none of the pieces make any bloody sense and none of the official story makes any sense. As a result of 9-11, they had the excuse to start the war on terror. And the war on terror led eventually to the excuse to invade Iraq. And because they didn't have an excuse, they made one up. Uh, weapons of mass destruction. It's the sequence that, or the technique that I call problem, reaction, solution. You create a problem covertly. You um, tell the people um, that they're in danger because of the problem and you want a reaction from the people, do something. And so after you've created the problem, got the reaction, do something, you then offer the solutions to the problems you created, which is to do what you intended to do all along, but couldn't uh, do or justify without the manufactured problem. Now, there's another version of that that I call no problem reaction solution. You don't need a real uh, problem. You just need to invent one and get the public perception that there's a problem, i.e. weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And so um, the invasion of Iraq was always going to happen. And all the bullshit about, oh, no, it could still be stopped was all lies. And so when Lord Goldsmith came along and said, actually, this could be illegal, of course, burn it, destroy it, because it was a danger to the plan of invading Iraq. Then there's another thing. Dr. David Kelly. David Kelly was a weapons inspector with great experience of Iraq. And he knew that what Blair and his spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, uh, in cohorts with British intelligence, were telling the British people about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was simply not true. And these people produced a dossier, a dossier, oh, say, be, be very afraid. Oh, we better invade then, yeah, better be afraid. Um, and what happened is that David Kelly, who no one really had ever heard of, in the public arena anyway, um, talked to a BBC journalist called Andrew Gilligan and told him that this dossier had been sexed up in other words, it was full of bloody lies to justify the war. Now, this was very, very dangerous to the credibility of the invasion. I mean, here was a weapons inspector of enormous experience in Iraq saying, actually, they're lying, in effect. And what then happened was that he was outed, was subject to enormous um, public attention, outed as the person who was behind Gilligan's source for the dossier being sexed up. And soon afterwards, he left home and went for a walk. A walk from which he never returned. Because he went into the woods and committed suicide. And the official story of his suicide is so ludicrous, so ridiculous, so incredible, uh, it takes the breath away. What I'm going to do in this video cast is go through the detail of these different elements. But for this, you know, opening, if you like, I'm going to just connect the dots of how the background went on. So, as I'll talk about in detail, Kelly was murdered by the state. So then they had an inquiry into what happened to David Kelly, which was instigated by Blair and his former bloody um, housemate, flatmate, um, Lord Falconer, the um, top law officer of the time, the, the Lord Chancellor. And they appointed this guy, Lord Hutton, a, a real establishment bloke. 
um, to oversee the inquiry into what happened to David Gelly, who died so, shall we say, conveniently for the agenda. And the Hutton inquiry, um, I can only repeat, was so ludicrous, so ridiculous, so incredible in the sense that its outcome was clearly decided before any evidence was given. This is why Lord Hutton has been known to this day as Lord Whitewash. The Dunblane story, the Dunblane horror, has been followed by the most monumental cover-up, which relates to protecting paedophile rings involving the rich and famous politicians, police, the judiciary, just as is the case with the VIP paedophile scandals in Westminster. These are all connected and the scale even with all the revelations that have come out the scale of these VIP rings which in the end if you go deep enough are one ring basically is absolutely extraordinary in its scale so let's look first of all at the express story and how far it went it's headed Top Military School Abuse Probed. Police Scotland has been ordered to carry out a full investigation into claims that officers covered up allegations of a VIP paedophile ring at a top military school. How many times have we heard this recurring theme, recurring theme? Simple reason why. When you are running paedophile rings involving politicians and the judiciary and top police people, then you have, by definition, the very people and the very establishment necessary to cover it up and not investigate it. It's real simple when you know how it works. The story goes on. Officers allegedly covered up claims of a VIP paedophile ring at the Queen Victoria School in Dunblane. Um, Glenn Harrison was a housemaster at Queen Victoria School when he became concerned about a group of powerful individuals having access to his pupils. He made a report to the old Central Scotland Police, but officers responded by breaking down the door of his flat and removing computer disks, papers and other evidence. Another recurring theme of what happens to people trying to expose the truth of these paedophile rings. And let no one be in any doubt that Dunblane Achillings and Thomas Hamilton were fundamentally connected to paedophile rings. <clears throat> Mr Harrison was then escorted from the school, which has Prince Philip as its patron, more of that shortly, and questioned by detectives in a local police station. After the disturbing incident in December 1991, he moved to the Shetland Islands and continued his successful career as a school teacher. Mr Harrison never received an explanation for the way he was treated, but the explanation I've just given. People exposing these rings are hardly popular with those protecting these rings. This Queen Victoria School is the same school connected to Thomas Hamilton, the Dunblane killer, who was seen walking around the school dormitories at night. And Glenn Harrison goes on as I'll go into detail later, about famous people turning up in fancy cars at the school and taking away boys who came back distressed. Thomas Hamilton was 
a a Jimmy Savile figure. Not on the same scale, but he did the same things. Not only was a paedophile, um, he a paedophile himself, which uh, came out and was covered up at the subsequent Dunblane inquiry, but he procured children for the rich and famous. And thus he was afforded the same protection by the establishment as was Jimmy Savile, who for decades and decades and decades did the same on a gargantuan scale. And when I go through this Dunblane story and its connection to the paedophile VIP rings, people might appreciate why we have seen in recent weeks the blatant, the pathetic, the disgusting efforts of parts of the British media and certainly the establishment. The campaign effort to trash the claims of the VIP paedophile rings in Westminster involving former Prime Minister Ted Heath, former Home Secretary Leon Britton and others. What happened after the horrors of Dunblane was that an inquiry was set up headed by a guy called Lord Hutton, senior Scottish judge, who was wheeled out to oversee a number of government inquiries. And it is my view, and the view of many others, having looked at what happened, that the Dunblane inquiry was the most blatant, outrageous cover-up of so much of the background to Thomas Hamilton and what was behind and who was behind and who was connected to the Dunblane tragedy. When we have a situation where Lord Cullen orders that evidence that was seen by the inquiry had to be sealed from public view for a hundred years, you know, if there's a brain cell on active duty, that there's something going on here and it's not very nice. We had a situation where evidence of the paedophile activities of Thomas Hamilton were dismissed, where people like the housemaster at the Queen Victoria School, Glenn Harrison, wasn't called to be a witness. Fundamental evidence he had to give, as I'll come to as we go through this. How other um, people who had crucial things to say, were not called by the inquiry. And how the efforts to cover up what happened were orchestrated by the Freemasonic and secret society networks of Scotland and probably further afield as well. And it's worth noting that for historical and other reasons, Scotland is a major global centre of secret society activity. They don't call it the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for no reason. This gives more credence to the evidence of a man called Lord Burton, who was a Grand Master, former Grand Master, of Scottish Freemasonry. 
And in the wake of Dunblane and the Cullen Inquiry, he spoke to a British Sunday newspaper, the News of the World, and said that the Cullen Inquiry had been a cover-up. Not too much study would confirm the validity of that. He talked about there was something sinister about the Dunblane affair, and so there was. And what he talked about was a elite um, group within Scottish Freemasonry that he called the Speculative Society. And he said that the Speculative Society was fundamentally involved in the Dunblane cover-up. And the Dunblane, uh, the um, Speculative Society is um, apparently based at um, Edinburgh University. And its patron is Prince Philip, the patron of the Queen Victoria School. And a senior member of the Speculative Society is Lord Cullen who, at least in one report I read, also had connections with the Queen Victoria School. Burton said that when he started asking questions about Dunblane, he was threatened um, with consequences if he didn't shut up. And that is what happens to people who speak out and try to expose the truth, or at least ask questions um, that the establishment doesn't want people to consider. So what we have with Dunblane, and I'll go into the detail as we go along, is the paedophile rings ring that is global in its entirety, we're seeing that show its head. So, with the Westminster scandal, there was that global paedophile ring um, coming to the surface in terms of Westminster and what Dunblane was, the background to Dunblane was that global paedophile ring coming to the surface and then being suppressed with regard to Scotland and what's interesting to me is that the royal family the members of the royal family come up again and again with regard to this not only do we have Prince Philip a patron of uh, the Queen Victoria School and a patron of the Speculative Society. We of course have Prince Charles and Prince Philip as friends for decades of Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile was brought into the inner royal circle, this ageing disc jockey who turned out to be, um, in terms of the public arena, um, a record-breaking paedophile who the police knew about but did nothing about see Thomas Hamilton but actually what the media is not saying is that uh, Savile was a procurer of children for the rich and very, very famous and that's why his back was watched just as until Dunblane so was Thomas Hamilton's and Savile was brought in to that inner circle by Lord Mountbatten, a known paedophile, who Savile himself said introduced him to the royal inner sanctum. And for decades and decades and decades and decades, Savile was a close friend of 
people like Prince Charles. And while that was going on, the police knew about Savile. The intelligence services, who, who are, are so protective of the royal family, you can't cough out of place without they know about it if you're close to them. They didn't know about Savile? Of course they did. So why? Why, when the intelligence services knew about Savile and the police knew about Savile, was he allowed for decades into the inner sanctum of the royal family? And why, in the same period, or part of that period, was he a very close friend of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher? The reason is the same as with Thomas Hamilton. The paedophile rings, like I say in the end, ring, infiltrate and infest the entire establishment worldwide, basically. And what we've seen in Britain is the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip, and I could go on for 20 minutes saying tip of the iceberg of what there is to know about paedophilia and the global establishment. So what I'm going to do today is um, go through Dunblane because from that comes an understanding of how the whole thing works because this Dunblane is a small part, horrific, but small part of a vast, vast whole, a vast network. And we must not let the malevolence of the British media or parts of it and the genetic malevolence of the establishment trash claims of these paedophile rings so that the public goes away and forgets about them. Could be your children tomorrow. And as I'm speaking, it will be someone's child, someone's children. Such is the vastness of what I'm exposing. I said that this was just the beginning. That the political class and the financial class, in effect, and the hidden hand behind them, though most of them don't even realise that, were not going to go quietly. They were not going to let uh, Britain leave the EU without a hell of a fight and so it's proving but there are there are some good things to this and the events of this week and that is that it is beginning to dawn on ever more people that there is a conspiracy for the few to control and dictate to the many I've been pointing this out and providing fine detail for over a quarter of a century, taken endless ridicule and dismissal um, as a result and untold abuse. And so it was nice to read in the Daily Mail today, in a comment uh, column, the following. The truth is that this judgment, which I'll come to shortly to um, throw a spanner in the works of Brexit, plays with fire, fanning the feeling, not just in Britain and Europe, but also among Donald Trump's supporters in America, that Western public life is becoming a conspiracy. The word is being used in the mainstream. I thought they were only theories, is becoming a conspiracy of tightly knit, self-serving establishment elites against the public. Well, the, the only thing wrong with that is it's not becoming. It always has been. The fact is that it's now becoming so blatant that it's becoming more and more obvious to everyone. Well, 
everyone with a brain on active duty. And what that judgment is referring to there is a legal challenge this week to the British government's right to trigger something called Article 50 to start the process of withdrawing a Britain legally from the, um, the, the web of deceit, mendacity and manipulation that we call the European Union. 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU in June. That is the biggest vote for a political party or a proposition in British history. And the British Parliament voted to have that referendum by a margin of six to one. Why? Because although there is a, a very significant majority of people in Parliament, in both the House of Commons, the elected and the unelected House of Lords, um, in favour of staying in the EU, they pretty much uh, convinced themselves that having a referendum would not be a problem because, of course, the, the great unwashed would just vote to stay in. Well, we didn't. And that provided this massive shock to the political establishment. Now, having given the public a referendum to decide whether to stay in the EU, and then um, having them vote um, in such massive numbers uh, to come out, it is simply the government's job now to do the will of the people and to trigger Article 50 and start the process, apparently it's going to take about two years, um, to get Britain out of the stranglehold of the EU, to take back uh, power to make our own laws, to um, not be dictated to by unelected dark suit bureaucrats in Brussels that no one's ever heard of. But, like I say, it was never going to be easy because the political class um, that thinks it's um, all knowing when it is deeply ignorant, those who are not among the few who are knowingly manipulating um, events, they are um, awash with ignorance, with uh, mendacity and with the arrogance that they know best, and therefore the will of the people doesn't really matter. Unless, of course, it corresponds with what they think is what should be done, and then oh, they're all for democracy then. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, at least in the words she spoke, was committed to triggering um, Article 50 early uh, next year. Brexit means Brexit, she said. The will of the people must be um, followed, adhered to, respected. But uh, this week, there was a legal challenge in the High Court in London, uh, led by a uh, millionaire um, city uh, of London uh, fund manager called Gina Miller and a few others I'll come to, um, to block the triggering by the government of Article 50 without um, a vote in Parliament. And, of course, what uh, Ms Miller uh, uh, said, that she was doing this to protect parliamentary democracy. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, that actually is not what it's about. You see, there's a, there's a majority in the Houses of Parliament 
that does not want Britain to leave the EU. So by um, taking it back there and having the, um, the uh, members of parliament and unelected uh, House of Lords decide what will and will not happen with regard to Brexit, despite 17.4 million people voting to come out and the majority in the referendum. Um, that means that we are now in a situation, unless the government wins its appeal, where a majority of members of parliament who want to stay in the EU now have enormous control over where Brexit goes from here. They can um, block it, they can delay it, they can water it down to the point where it's not Brexit at all, but just membership of the European Union under another name. And ideally, what they want to do is to bring about um, another second referendum. This is what happens when you go against the EU in a referendum. You've seen it all over Europe. Um, they then have another referendum and they overturn the result of the first referendum, which they didn't like. And um, so now um, the will of the people in the referendum is now being usurped by um, Parliament uh, and members of Parliament. And it is um, a situation that is frankly outrageous, disgusting, despicable, but in some ways a positive thing because it is showing people in their face that the financial and political class couldn't give a damn about what they want. Because this country, like every other country, is not run for the people. It's run for the political and financial classes. And like I keep saying, the hidden hand networks that work through those classes. So we're um, asked to believe uh, by this Gina Miller, who is um, a city fund manager and... Um, married to uh, a city slicker um, who's even got a, a well-known nickname in the city as um, Mr. Hedge Fund. And they uh, apparently run a, a, a an investment operation, which according to reports has portfolios worth around £100 million. So they're regular people, just like the rest of us. And she asks us to believe that this legal challenge um, to the government's right to trigger Brexit without a parliamentary vote is about process. It's not about politics. It's about politics, Gina, isn't it? And you know it. Here we have um, a lady who says that she was so horrified by the uh, Brexit vote that it made her, quote, physically sick. So here we're being asked to believe that someone so vehemently um, in favour of staying in the EU has uh, simply... Um, thrown this spanner in the works of uh, the Brexit process simply because she believes in parliamentary democracy and she wants to protect it. That, Gina, would be the parliamentary democracy that your uh, fantastic, um, what could be wrong with it, EU, has spent the last more than 40 years destroying with more and more laws being um, made by dark suit bureaucrats outside of this country, never mind outside of Parliament. This is the EU that is a 
a bureaucratic tyranny. Taking away and deleting, year on year on year, the right of sovereign parliaments to make decisions about what happens in their country. But you, uh, a supporter of the European Union in the extreme, and all that, I've only um, done this to throw the Brexit process into turmoil because you believe in parliamentary democracy. They really do think we're all freaking idiots. But as they found in the referendum, we ain't. Um, this is a quote from Gina Miller, um, who's only doing it to protect the process. I felt physically sick, she said, when the referendum result came through, because I thought, I don't think people know the ramifications of this of what's happened, and I felt really sorry that people had been tricked and fooled. You see, the financial and political classes, they know best, you see. So, if you are just a, an ordinary person, just one of the great unwashed, then um, you really don't know anything about anything. You haven't worked out that um, Britain has lost control um, of, of its own country. To the European Union. You haven't worked out all the um, European laws and regulations that are dictating, uh, uh, the, 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 like I say, the fine detail of your life and what you can do and can't do. You haven't worked out that, that, um, that smaller companies are being crushed by the weight of EU regulation that's destroying their ability to function. You can't work that out. You have to leave it to those who know best the city financiers and the politicians. You're just, you're just the man in the street, the woman in the street. What do you know? She goes on. Uh, we must not underestimate or forget the anger in Europe. Oh, really, I'm terrified. About our vote. They're very angry that we've had this relationship, yet we still threaten the union. Well, they should be angry then. Actually, there's a, a, a vast number of people in other European countries that want to do the same that Britain did and vote to come out. They're not being given the chance because the political class that knows best is terrified that they might do the same. It's extraordinary. Now, let's have a look at these other people who were behind this um, legal challenge, in which um, judges uh, decided that uh, it had to go to Parliament for a vote before Article 50 could be triggered and could not just be done by the government carrying out the will of the people. Um, the organisation behind this, or one of them, is called People's Challenge. Who are these people? Um, it was set up in the summer, by a guy called Graham Pigney, uh, a British expatriate. He now lives in France. And Paul Cartwright, who is a Gibraltar national and uh, works as uh, an environmental officer for the Gibraltar government. Was, was Gibraltar in England or Scotland or Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, the last time you alive? I don't believe it was. Mr. Pigney, originally from Fairham in Hampshire, is a semi-retired uh, man and has lived in a wine-growing region of Carcassonne for 19 years. So, the, one of the people behind this doesn't even live in the country and has lived in France for 19 years. Um, and he wants to, um, in effect, that, that's, that, that's, let's be very open and sensible about it, was to block Brexit. That's what this is really all about. No, it's the process. Anyway, also backing this legal action um, that won this uh, ruling this week, 
uh, is an organization called Fair Deal for Expats Group. Well, expats. So they don't live in England either, or Britain. No. Uh, it includes among them dozens of Britons living abroad. Oh, anyone notice the theme here? Um, and these include a British company director who lives in France, seems to be a popular place. Um, a businessman who runs holiday rentals uh, in um, Italy. And an English language teacher in Hamburg, Germany. I never saw Britain get a mention there. Mr. Pigney defended his decision to launch People's Challenge. He said, I happen to live in uh, France, but that is incongruous consequential in the context of the constitutional crisis we are facing. The constitutional crisis that your challenge is just massively uh, added to, by the way. And it's not inconsequential. Um, he, he says here, what's at stake is nothing less than parliamentary sovereignty. We need to make sure we do not hand the sovereignty of the UK to a self-appointed government. Well, what do you mean the sovereignty that's being handed to, to uh, in effect, self-appointed bureaucrats for the last 40 odd years? And of course, it's not inconsequential that someone who starts a legal challenge affecting uh, uh, the uh, vote of 17.4 uh, million people actually has lived in another country for 19 years. Uh, another guy um, in this uh, group um, is, a, is, is a Brazilian born hairdresser who no one seems to know um, much about and that is the organization with their 12 barristers obviously money no object there who have um, created a situation where the anti-EU majority or the anti uh, leave the EU majority in Parliament now, potentially, unless this government um, appeal is successful, now have um, enormous control over the Brexit process, how fast it moves, uh, the nature of what it is, etc. And that's the whole point of what has happened here. And um, the judgment um, was made by uh, three judges, um, including uh, one the Lord Chief Justice, who actually is a co-founder of an organisation dedicated to integrating um, laws um, all over Europe into uh, one EU uh, uh, group of laws that are basically all the same. In other words, centralising control in Europe via the legal system. And you know, in the last 24 hours, day or two, since this judgment was made, um, we, have, uh, we have seen so many extraordinarily ludicrous things said, like it's just about the process, not politics. Um, and another one is, um, I saw, that the judgment was made by an independent judiciary uh, acting above politics and outside politics, you know, you know, you know the the the, the greatest threat to humankind, it's freaking naivety. The idea that the judiciary is above politics and the judiciary is independent is absolutely ludicrous. Like I say, what it's really about is blocking Brexit. Um, or watering it down to the point where it ain't Brexit at all. And that's beyond all the bullshit. That's exactly what this is about. And it's, it's sickening to me anyway to see this group who call themselves progressives, word that came out of America, basically those of... of the left and greens and all these people, people call themselves liberals, um, to see them lining up alongside and cheering when, when they came out of the high court, um, the um, city uh, millionaires 
and lining up alongside the financial and political class uh, in demanding, in effect, that the will of the people is not adhered to and we stay in the EU. Here we have these so-called, because that's what they are, so-called progressives, who um, will go on marches and protest against the extremes of the financial class and the political class that they don't agree with, or that part of the political class they don't agree with, while um, they now stand alongside of them uh, to defend democracy by destroying it. They stand alongside people like Tony Blair, a man who so loves parliamentary democracy that he lied to Parliament to justify a catastrophic war that has cost the lives of uh, millions of people, um, both uh, in Iraq and as a result of what that invasion of Iraq has done since in terms of the Middle East. A man who didn't even keep his own cabinet informed of what was going on in relation to the invasion of Iraq. These progressives, the British equivalent of the bullshitter uh, in the United States, a classic fake progressive Michael Moore, are now standing shoulder to shoulder with people like Tony Blair. It is absolutely pathetic. And um, we're seeing, see, we are in a, 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 a point now where things are coming to the surface, where we can't ignore them anymore. This is why you've got that quote from the Daily Mail using the word conspiracy of the political class against the people. It's becoming blatant. Look at the Clinton emails, how they've shown the collusion with the media, how they collude to uh, um, block the candidates like Bernie Sanders that they don't want. How um, behind the scenes they're saying exactly the opposite to what they're saying in public. And how the whole system is so deeply, shockingly, unspeakably corrupt. And now we're having this put in our face again in Britain. The political class and that which was behind the political class, which, like I say, most of the political class doesn't even know that hidden hand exists. While it does its bidding, just like the progressives, global warming, um, political correctness, stay in the EU. These are all uh, desires of the hidden hand, which the progressives play out, thinking they're being progressive. It's hilarious. We want a tragic. Um, you know, we've reached the point now where we, the people, have got to say enough. We've got to stop cooperating with this system of corrupt, mendacious control and stop handing our power to it. They have the power to dictate our lives because we give that power to them. How can their number dictate to millions of people, globally billions of people? They can't unless those millions and billions give their power away to them. We've got to stop it because it's becoming more blatant and therefore more obvious because it's becoming more extreme. And um, the naivety of people, like I say, um, is extraordinary um, as we're seeing this week. Um, I saw uh, this post, it's just an example of endless ones, on social media, just after this uh, judgment was made, from a guy called Martin Cuff, whoever he is. Um, One day, we'll thank Gina Miller 
for saving the entire notion of British parliamentary democracy, he says. The British parliamentary democracy and sovereignty that has been systematically destroyed by the EU, which this lady clearly is desperate for us to stay in. And um, just before this vote, I read this story. Um, it's about a guy called David Attenborough, famous uh, filmmaker on nature. Uh, and he's uh, part of the BBC establishment, which is very pro-EU, um, which is part of the political establishment, the financial establishment. They're just dog masks on the same face. And um, this, is, this is what the story said. David Attenborough risked enraging millions by claiming the public is not wise enough to have uh, been given a say on Brexit. Note, note that theme. The public is not wise enough. We're the political classes. Only we know what's best. Could have been Gina Miller. The TV naturalist said the vote from 17.4 million British citizens to leave the EU had created a mess. Um, actually, it wasn't. But it, it's more of one now. Thanks to the political class. Um, and argued that the decision should have been left to MPs to vote on our behalf. Oh, David. I must send him the, uh, the link to Naivety Anonymous. These were the people that voted to, to have a war in Iraq. These are the people that have made catastrophic decisions um, in, in relation to giving power away to the EU, uh, that, that um, have made catastrophic decisions right across the board that have damaged um, life in Britain. Critics accuse the 90-year-old of being elitist. No, never, surely and failing to recognise what the people want. But that doesn't matter. You're the great unwashed. You just do what we say. Pat you on the head when you agree with us. Smack you on the head when you don't. Referring to Donald Trump's rise in the US, Sir David said, there's confusion, isn't there? Well, I, I suspect that David Attenborough is rather often confused myself. Um, there's confusion, isn't there, between populism and parliamentary democracy. I mean, that's why we're in the mess we are with Brexit, is it not? No. Do we really want to live by this kind of referendum? When it's fundamental to, to people's lives, yes. And he added, what we mean by parliamentary democracy is surely that we find someone we respect. Well, that's going to be bloody hard when it comes to MPs, isn't it? That we find someone that we respect, that we think is probably wiser than, uh, than we are. Well, that's even more difficult. What's the man talking about? But this, this is the mindset of the political, financial and media establishment. Um... um we think is probably wiser than we are, who is prepared to take the responsibility of pondering difficult things and then trust him or her to vote on our behalf. And a few people can't control the world. It's a piece of cake. The war on terror is a war on freedom. I've been saying that, writing that for years and years and years and so have many others in the alternative media. And the horrific events of the last week and more in Tunisia and France and parts of the Arabic world are simply the next step to advance the agenda of destroying human freedom and much else besides. And this is not some conspiracy theory pulled out of the ether. It's in documents that you can read 
and see and see the connections between. You can go back, for instance, to a document known as uh, A Clean Break, which was produced for Benjamin Netanyahu in the 1990s by the infamous neocons in the United States, people like Richard Pearl and others. And what it proposed in terms of what Israel should do is mirrored by current events in terms of the countries they should target, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and countries they should try to um, go into an alliance with in achieving the end of targeting those countries. You can bring it a few years forward to the year 2000, when the same neocons in the United States that were the force behind the Boy Bush administration, they produced a document through a uh, front operation called the Project for the New American Century, calling on the United States to fight uh, multi-theater wars against the same names, Syria, uh, Iraq, Libya, and, um, and others, Iran. And just after that, in um, 2001, in fact, one year after that to the month, we had 9-11, the official story of which is shockingly ridiculous and quite obviously a cover story. In the Project for the New American Century document, it said that a new Pearl Harbor would be required to justify these multi-theater wars against these countries in the Middle East and North Africa. And a year later, after this crowd behind that document came to power with the Boy Bush administration, we had 9-11 with its ridiculous official fairy tale. And what has happened as a result of that? The countries targeted in both a clean break and the project for the New American Century document have been bombed, turned into chaos, and in terms of Iran, constantly threatened and undermined. Then you can go just a very short time, a matter of days and weeks after 9-11, and you pick up the story told by General Wesley Clark, a supreme um, commander for NATO at one point, who said that he went to the Pentagon immediately after 9-11 and was told by a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the plan was, so this man had been told from on high, in other words, the Secretary of Defence's office, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, that they were going to um, target and regime change a series of countries in the next few years that followed that. And what were those names? Iraq, Libya, Syria, Iran. The story just is so blatant. And so, to achieve that, they had to find excuses for public consumption only to pick off those countries. So, of course, they went into Afghanistan, first of all, on the basis that bin Laden um, orchestrated 9-11 from some cave in Afghanistan, and so we must get rid of the Taliban, and we must invade Afghanistan. And then, of course, we had the weapons of mass destruction big lie from Bush and Blair to justify the invasion of Iraq. Tick. From these documents. Um, 
we had the extraordinary, extraordinary in the sense of it being so blatant, removal of Colonel Gaddafi in Libya on the basis of he's killing his own people when the people that he was in conflict with were trained, armed and funded mercenaries, most of them, um, funded, armed and trained by the West. So you create a situation where you create the problem by doing what I've just said in relation to these rebels and then you offer the solution which is removing Gaddafi because he's killing his own people when he's just fighting these Western um, trained, armed and funded rebels. And then, having ticked that off your list, Gaddafi's gone, you then um, go on to Syria. And um, Syria, uh, in terms of the, the rebels and the people that are behind all that, um, were largely um, shipped over from Libya when they'd done the job there. And so you had um, the attempt to overthrow Assad as quickly as they did Gaddafi. But Assad refuses to budge to this day. As a result of which they have to keep finding excuses to remove him and to help the rebels they control and dictate to remove him. And so there has been an effort um, to justify Western bombing of Syria. Of course, Obama and the British Prime Minister Cameron tried to do that a few years ago and they couldn't get it um, agreed to. Certainly um, Cameron couldn't in the Houses of Parliament. Um, and that was um, an attempt to justify the bombing of Syria on the basis that Assad had used chemical weapons against his own people. It's kind of a mirror of the technique of Gaddafi um, and, and that a whole uh, Libyan operation. But um, it was classic problem, reaction, solution or in this case, no problem, reaction, solution, because the evidence points to the fact that um, it was actually uh, members of this rebel group that actually um, used the chemical weapons. So, Assad won't go, and they couldn't justify bombing um, Syria as a result of this attempted contract over chemical weapons. And then ISIS starts to emerge. ISIS being a, an outgrowth of the whole terrorist um, movement in the Middle East that uh, really got underway after 9-11, um, going before, but started to really uh, um, become more and more prominent after 9-11, with Al-Qaeda and, and all that, which um, uh, the evidence shows very clearly was a creation of the uh, Washington administrations. So um, what do we do now? We, we need to tick off this latest country on our list, Syria, but he won't go. So we have to do something to get rid of him. And what they want to do quite clearly is start bombing Syria. So after this um, latest series of uh, horrific atrocities, um, especially from a Western point of view, the killing of nearly 40 people on the beach in Tunisia. We had this announcement this week from the Defence Secretary of Britain. Consider Syria IS ISIS strikes, Defence Secretary urges MPs. The Defence Secretary has paved the way for airstrikes on Islamic State targets in Syria, saying the extremists needed to be targeted at source. This Defence Secretary is a bloke called Michael Fallon. And the opposition party in Britain, um, Labour, um, 
has indicated it would not oppose military action in Syria as it did in 2013. That's when they tried to do the chemical weapons scam. Um, the party's acting leader, Harriet Harman, said Islamic State had to be stopped and Labour would look very seriously at any proposals brought forward by the government. She said the situation was uh, different from that in 2013. Uh, when Labour voted against airstrikes in Syria because IS was a terrorist organisation while President Assad was the head of a government, albeit a terrible regime. A bit like our own then. And so what's happened here is instead of directly bombing Syria on the basis of um, get rid of Assad because of chemical weapons, they've just change the argument slightly to get support and justification by saying actually no we don't want to bomb Assad we, we want to bomb ISIS in Syria right yeah in Syria in Syria yeah and of course the politicians who most most of them are not manipulating some of them are people in the know the people who are the designated front men and women for all this most of them are just clueless about the world they're actually living in and what's going on all around them. It's extraordinary how high you can go in the political pyramids and the system pyramids until you find someone that actually is in the know of exactly what's going on, or at least some of what's going on. Prime Minister David Cameron later said that ISIS propo uh, proposed an accidental threat to the West and its members in Iraq and Syria were plotting terrible attacks on British soil. And that's another aspect of this whole war on terror, and an aspect, very large aspect, of what happened in Tunisia. And that is to use these appalling attacks to justify more and more deletion of basic freedoms at home, to protect people from the terrorists. It's so simple and people in such large numbers still can't bloody see it. Do you create terrorist groups to do terror with this um, arm or this hand and then through this hand, you use governments and military to respond to the terror and in doing so, take away freedoms at home and justify wars in faraway lands. Behind me is the Amari Air Base, which is very relevant in this time because it's a um, NATO base in Estonia. Estonia, of course, bordering Russia and we have this uh, Operation Atlantic Resolve where um, the propaganda against Russia and how Russia is going to uh, invade um, border countries uh, has led to this build-up, the justification of this build-up um, of uh, NATO um, resources and the NATO uh, military operation in these border countries like Estonia. And the demonization of Russia has become so insanely ludicrous and so blatant in the sense of what it's trying to achieve. Uh, if you uh, can make people fearful of something, whatever it is, in this case, fear of Russia, then they will um, not protest and even support the fact that um, uh, you uh, will take action to protect them from what you've manipulated them to fear. And so everything now is the Russians. We've got a situation where um, in the United States we have um, the uh, emails that were leaked, which are of course devastating to um, the uh, campaign of Hillary Clinton, uh, and that was blamed on the Russians. The Russians are interfering with, um, as these uh, military vehicles go past, 
um, the Russians were interfering with the American election. When, um, in fact, the evidence produced was zilch. And then people say that, uh, okay, we have um, uh, all these American agencies that are saying the same, like uh, the FBI and so on. They're saying the same, that it was the Russians that was involved in it. But then you say, well, hold on a minute. These agencies were all controlled by the same people. And therefore, they're all singing from the same script, um, the same propaganda script that is trying to sell the line about Russia. And, uh, of course, it's going on in Europe. It's going on in terms of um, the... Uh, the uh, demonization of Russia in these uh, border countries and the rest of Europe, but particularly here, um, to the point where this um, Operation Atlantic Resolve has kicked in. And uh, talking to people um, in Estonia and, and uh, talking to people about their friends' uh, reaction too to all this, it's very clear that there um, are uh, large numbers of people who have actually bought this idea of the Russian threat, when, in fact, you look at the uh, history of uh, NATO since the Second World War, and what you have is NATO is the threat to peace. Um, what is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is supposed to protect uh, this area of the world, what is it doing bombing civilians in Libya? What is it doing through its constituent parts being involved in these uh, wider conflicts in the Middle East? NATO is not there to um, protect uh, people from the Russian threat. It's there as a war machine to um, impose the will um, of the uh, hidden hand which, uh, which controls it. There are people like NATO, organizations like NATO, the EU and what have you, they're all in the end, controlled by the same people. And uh, we've been uh, talking on the uh, streets of Tallinn, the Estonian capital, uh, to people to see uh, their reaction to what's going on and their reaction to uh, the propaganda about Russia and the attempts to make them uh, fear and thus accept uh, an ever greater NATO presence. Can I get your opinion on the sort of impending threat of Russia to the uh, Estonian community? Uh, it's hard to say where it's going at, at the moment, because in Estonia we have a few political parties that are Russian-minded, and also the things going in the USA, I think that the threat is never going to go away, and it's going to stay, but when Russia is going to make a move on Estonia, we don't know. This huge amount of propaganda poured to the, into the heads of our people on the daily and nightly basis it's been successful and people they know that the uh, uh, aggressor and the invader is from uh, is uh, on the east side of our border and that's the, and nobody nobody even cares about that and uh, and if you ask the common people they don't care because they have a lot of a lot of uh, difficulties to face them in everyday life so it's just i don't think it's, it's serious in the West, particularly in America and Britain, there's a massive propaganda and demonization of Russia, basically trying to fear people into the fact there's an impact, there's a, an attack imminent. Is there that feeling here in Estonia? Uh, we've always had that feeling, but since we got free from Russia in uh, 25 years ago, then since that time, the, everybody's always talking that there's a big threat, but actually we haven't seen any big moves from their side, so I think people are coming down because nothing actually has happened in like the past 25 years so many big things well actually so far we we we've been dealing only with propaganda which is uh, which makes the world only black and white uh, and basically what to let's say 90 even more percent the propaganda has been telling us that putin is is about to invade uh, estonia any minute and and we should be um, prepared for that, and especially we should be de depending on our NATO allies. And, well, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think that it's the right approach. And um, um, there, there are no signs who 
documented signs that uh, Putin is, is preparing an invasion to anywhere. Because if people are telling about uh, Ukraine, there's been no invasion, and even in NATO, great leaders, big leaders, Alafuzov and others, admirals, they've been telling that uh, in Ukraine, let's say, um, uh, the legal government is not facing and fighting against Russian federal troops. There are definitely there are some some um, volunteers from all over the world there, but but and the same is here. So so far we've been uh, hearing only what it is, let's say, propaganda and no analysis whatsoever. How strong is the propaganda on the media here, trying to scare people into the fact that big bad Russia are going to come and invade again? I think it's very strong, because uh, I think uh, who listen every, every day, uh, mainstream media, they are scared. Well, in the, in the West, in Britain and America, we've had a lot of propaganda against Russia, and Putin in particular, trying to paint him as a modern-day Stalin. What's been the, the response to the propaganda here in Estonia? Are people scared? Are people, f are people actually buying the propaganda against Russia? I think people are buy, buying the propaganda very much. They, Estonian people uh, is saying in Estonia, if it's uh, written on newspaper, it must be true. So there are some views of Estonians on... Um, how they see the current situation with regard to the NATO build-up uh, in their country and indeed uh, other countries bordering Russia. And uh, just come a mile down the road from that NATO airbase and here is a, a cemetery, a military cemetery from the uh, time of the Soviet Union which of course um, occupied uh, Estonia and uh, it brings it home just a mile apart you've got those that are um, engaging in war and those who came to an end as a result of military actions and we have allowed the world to be taken over by the most extreme psychopathic mind and when you see the number of people who have been killed uh, and maimed uh, both uh, military and civilians decade after decade after decade uh, this world has been constantly at war you, you look at the history of wars involving the United States alone since 1776, it's absolutely shocking. So, why is it happening? Why, um, here again, are we um, building up and pushing towards uh, another conflict, this time with, with Russia, which of course will bring uh, China in as well? Why is... Uh, that mayhem and death and destruction happening day after day uh, in the Middle East, year after year after year. Because um, the psychopathic, uh, insane people that we have allowed to take this world over are deciding that that is how it's going to be. And had Hillary Clinton uh, been elected uh, as President of the United States, this war with Russia would have definitely kicked off. It might uh, still do so with Donald Trump, uh, and I hope that the conciliatory things that he said with regard to uh, conflict in Russia um, are followed through. But with Donald Trump, he reverses what he says and what he thinks so often, then we've got to wait and see, not take his word for it. And it's not um, encouraging when you've got uh, Trump in his election campaign talking about a massive increase in the United States military. It's also, all, 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 all uh, ready rather, vastly, vastly in uh, um, 
uh, proportion greater than something like seven other countries combined, including China and Russia. I mean, how much military does the United States want? But of course, it's not the United States military. It's the military of the hidden hand. And all this uh, money, this extraordinary level of spending while Americans sleeping the streets that is um, spent on the military is not for the benefit of the United States. It's for the benefit of that that works through the United States, that works through its presidents, that works through its military and its Pentagon. And these are the people we've give, given the world away to. And we need to take it back. So, is it really um, too much of an ask that instead of uh, demonizing Russia, that those in power sit down and come to an agreement with Russia, come to a situation, for instance, where Russia and the countries of Europe and the United States combine together to sort out the um, United States UK created terrorists in, um, in the Middle East and bring that horror to an end. If they were reasonable people who generally wanted to bring it to an end, that would have happened already. But they're not. Putin seems very accommodating and, and intellectually is uh, far uh, more intelligent than the Western world leaders combined. I'm not saying that he's um, God's gift to humanity and, you know, he um, runs tea parties for kids. He's obviously a, a ruthless man or he wouldn't have been running Russia for so long. But neither, although the propaganda would like us to believe it, neither is he Stalin. Neither is Russia now the old Soviet Union. And the offer is there for the West to come to an accommodation with Russia so we can all get on with our lives. I hope Trump, uh, like I say, follows through with what he's saying and that happens. But in the background, the hidden hand won't want it to happen because the hidden hand wants World War III, because that's been planned all along. Three world wars to transform the nature of human society. The first two world wars transform the nature of human society. Look what happened. And they want to complete the job with World War III. That was always the, that was always the plan. And this is what this demonization of Russia is all about. So we, as uh, the people... The, the human race, billions of us, who face the consequences of what these uh, insane people in the shadows are doing, need to understand how the game's played and no longer to accommodate it, no longer play a part in it, no longer uh, meekly walk along saying, yes sir, no sir, they must know what they're doing. They don't except that they do know that they're seeking to bring about